Good evening, everybody. How are you doing tonight? I'm good? How many of you happened to see the new Star Wars trailer? Yeah? Like that? Pretty good? Excited, right? This sermon's going to be even better than that. Uh, just kidding. The goal is not to knock it out of the park with every sermon, but really just to see and have God work in and among us. Uh, for the sermon this evening, we'll be in the book of Galatians that we are working through this year as a church, and we're going to wrap up the second major section of the book, which has been laying out some key stories that are important for us as Christians to know. First and foremost, the most important story of all, the story of Jesus, and then we saw the story of Paul, the human author of Galatians, and then last week we got to know this guy, Titus, who is... Uh, Paul's apprentice and ended up being this key figure in early Christianity because he was the first really well-known Gentile, non-Jew, who became a Christian and he was allowed to stay a Gentile. That was a big deal because it meant this, this Christianity thing, who Jesus is and, and what he accomplished that transcended racial and religious traditions. That's, that's big. The gospel of Jesus Christ is, is bigger and better and the best answer to all issues concerning race, religion, and righteousness. Today we'll finish up this Stories You Should Know section by getting to know another key person in the Bible and in early Christian history, the Apostle Peter. Peter. We'll get to know some other stories later on in the book, but before that, the book will take this turn and dive into some pretty hefty stuff in a section that will start in two weeks called Big Words to Know, and we'll go after that hard. But for tonight, the story of Peter. Peter, he, he happens to be my favorite character and person in, in the Bible other than Jesus. His story is uh, my favorite. I've always loved uh, Peter because I, I really personally identify with him more than anyone else in, in the Bible. Peter, he's this uh, passionate, um, very gifted, very handsome, uh, imbecile of a, of a man. And he just keeps blowing it over and over again. But each time he... He learns and he, he grows through it and God uses him in mighty ways. And, and that's what I really love about Peter because even though Peter's such a screw up, God still works in him and has grace for him and changes him. And if there's hope for Peter, then, then there's hope for me and there's hope for you. Uh, what we're going to see in Peter today is, is uh, some great things about his life and how God worked in him and then some pretty big blind spots. All of us, we have, we have blind spots. And Christianity really is uh, so much more than, uh, than being really this like straight line and a walk to heaven. Man, it is, it's littered with uh, blunders and moments of weakness where we, in our foolishness, we, we sin and we stray from God and, and we have to have our eyes open to see Jesus and his goodness. Oftentimes the line to heaven, it's, it's much more messy than just a straight shot because of our blind spots. I think that, that song we just sang referencing that story of blind Bartimaeus is one of the many blind people that Jesus healed. It really it encapsulates what my prayer for us is today, that God would, he would move and work in us to help us recognize where we are blind. Uh, and that, that he would give us the courage then to stand up and to call out to him, to call out to his name, and that then Jesus would heal us, that he would open our eyes to see his glory his goodness, and his grace toward us. So really, that's the cry of, of my heart tonight is, is Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. So with that, let's go ahead and read our text. I'll read it, declare it as God's word, and then we can thank him for it together. I saying thanks be to God. We're in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, and I pray that you would help us uh, to see our blind spots. Help us to see where we, we need you to work in us, where we need you to, to change us and to save us, Lord. Thank you for the story of Peter. Would it point us to you, our Savior, we pray in your good name, Jesus. Amen. All right, four different things in this text the story brings out for us that I want us to walk through. So you think rock reputations, 
foolish fears, slipping soldiers, and then beloved brothers. With our first point in rock reputations, what I'm getting at really is Peter's name. Cephas is in our text here, and that's Aramaic for, for Peter. And that's the name that Jesus gave to him for all of his life. From a time of birth on through adulthood, he was known as Simon. Simon was his birth name until he met Jesus as a grown man. And Jesus told Simon that he would be Cephas, or Peter, which is simply the word for rock. Uh, in our text for today, it's actually the third time that Peter's mentioned in the book of Galatians. And it's clear in our story that Peter's this, this really well-known figure in the church in early Christianity. So when his name is said, automatically that would have brought up this whole gamut of events and accounts of who this guy Peter was. He had this robust reputation. He was well-known. So what I want us to do in this first point is, is to walk through some of the, the key accounts and episodes of, of Peter's life and who he was and what brought him to, to this point in the story that we're looking at tonight. So that when we, we read Peter's name here in this particular episode, we know all that's been going on based on who Peter was that brought him to this point because he really wasn't always Peter the Rock. It took him a while to get there before he was recognized as Cephas the Rock. Make sense? All right, so the story of Peter, it begins with him as Simon in a little town, a little fishing village called Bethsaida. He runs this fishing business with his brother Andrew and then these two other guys, James and Don, the son of Zebedee. Uh, Simon, he's this devout Jew. He worships God every weekend and with his people. He hears his word and he dreams of this day when God will once again act on behalf of his people and send this long-awaited Messiah to deliver of his people from oppression and evil and hardship. And, and for Peter, that at that time was the tyranny of Rome who ruled over them as a people. Andrew, his brother, he happens to be out one day and he goes out to hear this uh, crazy guy that's been called John the Baptist and he's preaching and baptizing people in the Jordan River and, and he's crying out and his message, make ready the way of the Lord. And then one day Jesus shows up and John the Baptist points at him. He says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Andrew runs home and he goes and gets Simon. He says, brother, we found the Messiah. He's here. And so he takes Peter to meet Jesus and Peter meets Jesus. And the Bible says that when he met him, Jesus looked at him. He looked at him in, intently. It was for how long? Probably for a while, because it said Jesus knew what was in man. He looks into Peter's future and all that he would become, all who he was currently was, and he says, you are Simon, son of John, but you shall be called Cephas. It was a, a promise. You shall become who he would become, because Jesus actually didn't call him Peter until after his resurrection. When he looked into Simon and saw this guy, surely he saw the, the roughness of his character, all his rough edges, the self-confident pride, the times when he would be unpredictable and unreliable, the times when he would be uh, outspoken and he would overreact. He saw it all, looked ahead and saw all that, that Peter would be. And, he, and Peter probably felt that look as Jesus gazed into his soul. But then then Jesus just, he, he accepted him anyway and he welcomed him in and he gave him a name. Gave him this name, Rock. It's an odd name for Jesus to give him. I mean, Rock, Cephas or Peter, it wasn't a name that people went by back in that day. Peter, this man with a stench of fish on his clothes, probably didn't know how to take it. You'll be Rock. You're going to be Rock. That's going to be your name. Rock person. It would be a fitting name, truly, for the journey of Peter's life. Rocks, if you don't know, they, they're formed through a very slow, long, very difficult process that takes heat and pressure as sediment is gradually compacted together over time. It's a very arduous process. When Jesus first uh, meets Peter, he invites him to join in on his mission. He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Peter likely, just in disbelief that a, a rabbi would invite him to be his disciple, he, he gladly leaves behind his business. Uh, before they leave town, Peter experiences the first of many rock-forming incidents with Jesus. Peter and his guys, they'd been out fishing all night, and 
they didn't catch anything. It was a, it was a bad night, and it's just as they're coming in, as the dawn is breaking, Jesus walks up on shore, and he's all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Hey, guys, let's take the boat out for a catch. <laughs> and Peter says to him, Lord, we've, we've toiled all night, and we didn't catch anything. But Jesus persists, and, oh, let's take the boat out for a catch. It, it had to be this humbling moment for Peter. I mean, he, he knew the Sea of Galilee. I, I mean, it was his life, his livelihood. I mean, he, he knew where the fish were, where to find the fish, what times to go, how the, the wind and the tides affected things. But, but here comes this, this preacher who's a carp and a carpenter up to this point, and he thinks he knows better. And he's questioning his very competency as a fisherman. The one thing that he knew how to do well. Hmm. Reluctantly, Peter concedes. He says, okay, we'll go. But just because you say so, Lord. And they go out and they fish and they catch more fish than they ever have before. It was the first of many times that Peter would learn he would have to trust Jesus at his word and that Jesus always knew better. The next episode for uh, Peter was an, another fishing episode where uh, they're out fishing again in the middle of the night. Jesus isn't uh, with them and a storm comes upon the boat. And, and in the middle of the night, they, they see what they, it looks like this ghost figure walking out on the water and they cry out in fear. And then they hear this voice. It is I. Do not be afraid. And they recognize the voice. It's, it's the voice of, of Jesus. <laughs> and then with Peter and his newfound confidence in Jesus, where he, he, he burst out, Lord, if it's really you, then you, you bid me, you tell me to come out onto the water. And so he hears just this one word from Jesus, come, come. And old Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking on water towards Jesus. He sees him and he walks towards Jesus. But then he starts to, he feel the, the wind and he looks at the waves and he gets his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink into the water. Not knowing what to do, he just cries out, Lord, save me. Jesus walks up to him and pulls him out. And I can just imagine with this little twinkle in his eye, this, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? After that, Jesus' ministry was well underway and all kinds of people, crowds are following him, people all around. People are forming all kinds of opinions about him. And, and during a brief break from the crowd, Jesus, he pulls the disciples aside and he says, hey, hey, who do the people say that I am? And, and right away, the, all the disciples, they start uh, giving their just various answers. You know, some say, you know, John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah or one of the other prophets. And Jesus says, well, who, who do you say that I am? <laughs> and, and right away, Peter jumps up, blurts out, oh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In response, Jesus commends him quite an insight, truthful insight into who Jesus was. And he commends him, sort of. He says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then he repeats this promise to him to, to make him rock, saying, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Jesus wasn't going to give him any credit for figuring that out on his own, but perhaps Peter's just starting to see who Jesus really was. Peter witnessed Jesus saying and doing many things during the three years Jesus spent with them. And then, and then the, the time with them began to draw to a close. And Jesus started talking about how he would have to suffer and to die. And many of the, the crowds that had been following Jesus started to leave, started to thin out, no longer watch and listen to what he had to say. And at one moment, Jesus turns to the disciples and he says to them, you guys going to leave too? And once again, Peter blurts out, Lord, where else will we go? For you have the words of life. Some great insights that Peter had. But then Jesus gets a little bit more specific. Uh, perhaps Peter thought to, to suffer and die was just this metaphorical thing. Jesus says, no, I, I'm going to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes. I'm going to be killed. I'm be put to death. And, and right away in this, this moment of pride and, and dedication to Jesus, Peter pipes up and he starts correcting Jesus. Oh no, we, we're going to do it. We'll be able to overtake Rome. You're the Messiah, Jesus. That will never happen to you. Telling him not to say or think such things. Essentially tells Jesus he's wrong. 
And immediately, it's almost like this hot fire rises up in Jesus' chest, and he just sternly rebukes him. He says, get behind me, Satan. That must have sucked. Um, I mean, one moment, you're the hero having insight. Oh, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And next moment, you're Satan. Um, Peter, he would have to learn that there's no way around the cross. It wasn't an easy lesson. As things came to a close, Jesus, he had one last supper with his disciples. At dinner, normally a, the house servant would wash everybody's feet before the meal because, you know, they didn't have paved roads and there were sandals and it's dirty, it's next to the food and, and whatnot. And they're having this last dinner and to everyone's shock, Jesus picks up a towel in the basin and he washes each one of the disciples' feet. He came, come, comes to Peter and, and, and before, Peter, before Jesus touches Peter, Peter refuses. He says, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. And in gentle reply, Jesus says to him, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. And Peter says, oh, okay, okay, then we'll, we'll wash all of me, my head, my hands, and my feet, all of me. And, and Jesus basically says, you just don't get it, Peter, but one day you will. One, one day he'd be a rock, but you have to learn humility and servanthood. Peter, from this point, he goes from bad to worse after this. Once again, Jesus breaks down what's about to happen to him and he looks at all the disciples and tells them that every one of them are going to leave him and abandon him. Peter, in this self-confident pride, he, he stands up and he actually looks down on his fellow brothers, the other disciples, and he says, Lord, you know, everyone may leave you, but I, I will never leave you. <laughs> and I imagine Jesus just hung his head at that point and with this pain in his voice, he says, Peter, you're going to deny three times that you know me. Peter, he was always thinking that he was better. Thinking he could do it. If everyone else will fail, he would succeed. But he couldn't. After that, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus wants to pray, ask them to, to pray. But three times, Peter and the other disciples, they just fall asleep. Then Judas, the traitor, along with the other chief priests and the elders, they come with clubs and swords and chains. And, and Peter thinks, ah, oh, okay. This is it. It's all going to go down. I'm going to prove my loyalty. He whips out a sword and he cuts off one of the servant's ears. And with one final rebuke, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, put your sword away. And he heals the guy's ear and he gives himself over to be arrested and crucified. All the other disciples run off, but, but Peter is curious and so he sort of follows Jesus as they're taking him away uh, from a distance and and does this through the night, and he's standing there warming himself by a fire, and this girl comes along, and she recognizes him. Oh, you were with him. You were one of his followers, weren't you? And he denies it, and she asks him again, and, and each time he says he, she, he doesn't know what she's talking about, and then the third time she says, no, you were one of them, and he just explodes in this rage. He says, woman, I do not know the man that you're talking about. And right then this rooster crows, and Peter remembers Jesus' words that he would deny him three times, and, and he runs away just weeping bitterly. He finally breaks. He hits rock, rock bottom, realizing what a wretch he was. Jesus is crucified. Peter and the other disciples, they all go into hiding. They're afraid they're going to be killed next. And then on the third day, Mary comes to them and says, we went to the tomb, and the tomb was empty, and we saw Jesus, and he's risen, and he's alive. And, and Peter can't believe it. He runs to the tomb to go see for himself. And then later that day, Jesus, he appears to all of the disciples in their hiding place. And then after that, several occasions over the period of 40 days. And one occasion is particularly special. The disciples, they go back to fishing, and, and uh, Jesus meets them there, hooks them up with one, one last big catch, just like old times and then tells him to get on the mission with planting churches. And after this, he, he pulls Peter aside on the shore, and um, he now calls him Peter for the first time, no longer addresses him as Simon. Uh, and he asks him three times, Peter, do, do you love me? Do you love me? And, and each time Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Uh, in that moment, Jesus restores Peter, Three times of denial and three times affirms Peter's love for him and then tells him to feed his sheep, to feed his sheep. Jesus, he ascends into heaven. 
to that period of 40 days and the disciples wait and pray. And then the day of Pentecost comes and then no longer out of a desire to be better than everyone else, but merely to exercise his gift and be obedient to Jesus. Peter, he rises up and he begins to preach. He preaches the gospel and his first act is the rock man. And tons of people become Christians. Thousands on that day. And after that, Peter starts preaching about Jesus everywhere and planting churches and healing people. He's, he's no longer scared of imprisonment or death, but he still had not yet arrived. He still had some things to learn. Because Peter, he, at this point, he's only ministering to Jews. And so one day God gives him this vision. He's, like in, he's in this trance sort of state, and he sees this white sheet, and, and falling down on the white sheet are all kinds of animals. And he hears this voice, Arise, kill and eat. And Peter responds, oh, no, Lord, my, I've never eaten anything unclean. For, for Jews weren't allowed to eat pork and other meats. But God says, no, now because of Jesus, it's okay. And he sends him to this Gentile's house named Cornelius. So Peter goes to Cornelius' house, and he shares with them all about who Jesus is. And, and they believe, and they become Christians. And at that point, Peter gets, and he says, oh, I, now I understand that God shows no partiality, that Jesus is for Gentiles too, and that they are saved by grace through Jesus and not by whether or not they become Jews first or not. Uh, whether or not they eat meat isn't an issue anymore. Uh, Peter, he takes some flack for that because he starts uh, eating meat with the Gentiles and when he gets back to Jerusalem at the Jerusalem church. But when they question him about it, he stands firm. He tells them about his vision, how all the people in the household of Cornelius became Christians and, and the church accepts it. You can go read it in Acts 11. And, and, and then that brings us up to to speed with where we're at today in our text for the story. Picks things up a few years later in a different city in Antioch, at the church in Antioch. We're here, Peter, he will fail and fall in this brief lapse once again. What's happening uh, in the story is more and more Gentiles are becoming Christians. Um, they're joining the church, and back then Sunday worship was like an all-day thing, you know, it'd sing like we did, and, and they'd hear from God's Word and receive the Lord's Supper, and they would, they would have a, like a potluck afterward, and it'd usually be likely an all-day thing, and they'd all eat lunch together, and apparently everybody's mixed together, Jews and Gentiles, they're all just enjoying one another and the joy that Jesus had given them. But then this circumcision party shows up. Most likely they're from the same group that we talked about uh, last week, these guys who are all, that were all hung up on whether Titus was circumcised or not. Um, they're this group who's all hung up on the Jewish laws. And they think, yeah, you know, Jesus is okay, he's the Messiah, but on, you know, only if you become Jewish first. You need to embrace Jewish laws and the Jewish way of life in order to get Jesus. Two of the, the biggest emphasized Jewish laws in that day were that you had to be circumcised, and that you could not eat most meats, and definitely could not eat with Gentiles. They called it table fellowship. Eating. Eating was and is an important event. What you eat and who you eat with, it says something about who you are. So these guys show up, and, and Peter and the other Jews, they're there, and they're eating with the Gentiles, and in response, Peter, the, the rock apostle, he has all the Jews get up and separate, either to the other side of the room, or maybe they has the, the Gentiles go to the basement or something. But whatever he does is he stops eating with the Gentiles and he forces, the text says in verse 14, all the other Jews to follow suit. And, to, and they do, including Barnabas, who was another key leader in the church. Paul's there, sees this, and he goes ballistic, openly challenging Peter on this before everyone. And then... The story just kind of ends, and Paul launches into this intense theological explanation that we'll get into in a couple of weeks. Um, it's quite a story, such a tenuous moment. Peter has this robust reputation by this point as the rock, and then this happens. Well, it's taken a little bit to recount the story of Peter, um, so the we'll, sermon will be a little bit more lopsided uh, in terms of our outline. But what I want to do from this point, I want to take a, a few minutes and just look at two things on our next uh, two points. Uh, what was going on with, with Peter that Paul brings up from this story? Some significant things for us. The first one that he brings up is what's going on with Peter in his 
heart. So let's look at that in our next point, foolish fears. Oftentimes we have this tendency to focus on outward actions, what's done outwardly and not address the heart. But Jesus taught that everything that we do, that it always comes from the heart. And so that's what the gospel does. The gospel always addresses the heart, and that's what Paul here does as a faithful servant of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So look at verse 12 again with me. Before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back, separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So see those two words, drew back? Uh, that, that, the word that's behind that, it's a word for retreat. It's, it's a pulling away and going to a sheltered position. I mean, one minute he's laughing and enjoying life and food and fellowship, the good company, these Gentiles, and then the next, next minute he sees these guys and then he's acting totally different. I mean, separates himself, and then verse 14, look, it says he forces them, forces everyone else to do that too. So he not only does this thing that's, that's likely very, if you try to imagine it going down, it's very like weird and, and awkward and, and probably hurtful to his Gentile friends, but then he abuses his place of authority as an apostle by making everyone else do it too. He forces them to do it. Now look at the why here. Why? What is the, the reason that Paul says why he, he did this? Is it, is it because Peter thought that he was doing something wrong and he got caught? No. I mean, clearly, he already testified at Jerusalem Church, which was like the, the capital church, the first church, the mega, first mega church. Uh, and he had already testified there that God had said that the food is clean now and Gentiles are, are clean, and he ate with them. And there he was bold. Here, check it out. I'll read it from, for you from Acts 11. It says, this is what he, he had said at the Jerusalem church, where James was uh, the lead preaching pastor. He says, What God has made clean, do not call common. The Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction, and the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. If then God gave the same gift to them as us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And this is what he says when they question him about eating with the Gentiles. So, the reason isn't because he thought it was wrong to eat with the Gentiles. Clearly, he thought it was fine. The last time someone questioned about it, he stood up to them. This is what he said. Now, that's why Paul calls him a hypocrite and says that he's acting hypocritically because it was an act. A hypocrite is a, it's a word that's about play acting where you put a mask on, on who you really are. Like when you, when you watch a movie, that's not who those people are really are. They're, they're acting out a story and the character of another person. Peter thought it was fine, but he acts like, he didn't think it was fine before these guys. So why? Why does he do that? Do you see the reason why? What's his heart issue here? He says it's because of fear. He was fearing them. What was it about these guys? He, something about them caused fear in him, made him afraid. What was it? We don't know. What we do know, though, is that fear was one of Peter's old sins that he battled with. Remember the the wind and the waves with Jesus when he got his eyes off Jesus and he was afraid? Remember with the, the girl when he's at a distance by the fire and she's questioning whether he knows Jesus and he's afraid and denies knowing him? Fear. Really, most of the time, it isn't new sins that we struggle with as Christians. Usually, it's the same old ones. The ones that we thought we beat and then they just rise their ugly head again. Got to battle it all over again. A number of weeks ago now, we talked about people-pleasing and our tendency as human beings to always want to make uh, people happy or them to think well of us. With this case, it's sort of the converse, where we don't want people to think bad of us. So we'll say and do things to guard and to protect our reputation. I think that's most likely what was going on here. Peter, now he's the rock. He's got a reputation to keep up. And his pride seems to have got the best of him. The story reminds us that no one is ever so spiritual or so mature that they can't fall. None of us. All of us, even the best of us, can get blind spots where fear and foolishness can cloud our judgment. Sometimes fear of people's criticism, man, it, it can like handcuff you and just prevent you from being really honest and, and holding you back from doing what God is really putting your heart to do. You're afraid, and so you don't act. Have you guys ever felt like that? Um, 
What are the things that have a tendency to breed fear in you? I mean, is it people's perception of you that they might think bad things of you and reject you? Is it money? Fearing whether you'll ever have enough? Is it fear of the future, whether things will go the way that you think they should or that you want them to? Or maybe it's fear of disappointing someone else. Afraid that you'll be able to, you won't be able to perform or live up to their expectation. It's a fear of people getting to know the real you. Because you're afraid if they found out what you're really like, they, they wouldn't like what they see. I mean, there's all kinds of fears, aren't there? And the answer to all of our fears is to fear God, to trust Him with all of our fears, and to boldly, boldly and, and fearlessly follow Him no matter what. Let's move on and talk about why Paul says this is such a big deal. Such a big deal that he had to publicly correct Peter. And I'm calling this point slipping soldiers. Verse 11 here says that Paul, he, he publicly opposed Peter to his, his face. That is intense. Normally, the rule of thumb is however public the offense is, is how public the correction needs to be. If it's a private offense, you go to the person alone, you and them, you can deal with it privately. But if it's public, done in front of a lot of people, then the correction should be public in front of a lot of people. Uh, here in this case, I think it's not even so much that. I think there's even more at work. Paul and Peter, they're, they're both apostles. I mean, they've been good friends. Last time they were together in Jerusalem, Peter had given Paul the right hand of fellowship. We looked at that last week. I mean, now here they, here they are, it's a couple of years later down the road, and now it's not the right hand. It's right up in each other's face. So I think what's, there's, there's more going on than just a public-private thing here. I mean, since they were leaders, they could have worked it out in unity privately, but something bigger was at stake in this issue. So look at verse 14 again with me, a little closer. Verse 14. I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Paul sees what, what takes place, and he realizes that the very nature of the gospel itself is at stake. This phrase, not in step, that's a, a military term. It has to do with how, how soldiers walk or how they march. So to keep in step, you've got to keep up and you've got to keep in line. But they're out of step. That's why in the previous verse he says that even Barnes was led astray, out of line. So what's the issue? Why or how is the gospel at stake here? I mean, this is strong language. Can't get much stronger than this. I mean, Paul said that the very truth of Christianity itself is in danger of being compromised over this issue. Why? What's, what's wrong with their conduct? What is, what is gospel conduct? What is the, the gospel line and the gospel march? Well, the gospel is the good news that Jesus walked for us that he lived the life that we've failed at. He died for our sins, for all of our failures, and rose again. And the life we now live is the one that we, we believe and receive in him. We receive Jesus' life in us. So Jesus' conduct is the gospel. It's not about our conduct. Our conduct, we're failures. It's about Jesus' conduct and what he did for us. The gospel is uniquely opposed to any contribution of any of our conduct. We cannot get it right with our conduct, no matter how hard we try. But Jesus did it. Jesus did it for us, and he gives himself and his person and his work to us. But Peter did here in forcing them to separate, as he made it so that if the Gentiles really wanted to be accepted into the church relationships and be welcomed at the lunch table and be received by Jesus. Oh, well then they got to become Jews by not eating meat. Your conduct's going to have to change. And that's anti-gospel. I mean, you see, every person was free to either eat meat or not eat meat according to their preference. That was fine. But when there's this pressure to force them to do something different in order to be accepted, then the gospel was threatened. Then the gospel's threatened. It's funny how much food can be an issue. Things like this can still sneak in 
today. I mean, think about it. I mean, you can be, you're either supposed to be like vegan or paleo, uh, gluten-free or gluten-gorging. Uh, I, you know, either have free-range eggs or range-free, where you like them caged. Uh, you know, grass-fed beef or corn-fed beef. You're either anorexic or obese. You're either drunk or sober, healthy, unhealthy. I mean, everyone's got this idea of what you should eat and drink and how you should do it. I mean, it's all over, nonstop, all the time. I have no idea how we have survived and existed as a human race for this long. I mean, I think apples now even are bad for you. I mean, it's not just food, though. It's anything that we divide over. I'm sure when Paul saw all of them get up and move and separate to not eat together, he was just provoked in his spirit because this is the very reason that Jesus came to earth and died so that people could be united with God and united with one another. He didn't come to divide us, but to join us to join us together in his love and his grace, regardless of who we are or whether or not we eat meat or not. In fact, one of the things that Jesus constantly did when he was here was eat with people. He was known for eating with sinners, with tax collectors and prostitutes. I mean, think about it, even, I mean, he fed the 5,000, fed the 7,000. He ate fish and bread and drank wine with his disciples. One of the charges and accusations against Jesus, one of the biggest ones against his ministry, they said that he was a, a drunkard and a glutton. His food and drink was so much a part of what Jesus did with people to share and show them his love and grace. But it's not just food. It's anything that divides us where you say, you have to do this in order to be a Christian, in order to be accepted and welcomed by us and by God. I mean, if, if Paul didn't confront Peter, then once again, like with circumcision last week, man, we wouldn't be here. I mean, if, if you had to not eat meat and become a Jew, if that was required in order to get Jesus, then Christianity would have never made it out of Israel and would just would have ended up as a small Jewish sect. To have to become Jewish to become Christian. And that's not the gospel. Now, food's... Not the issue. It's anything that you put in that place. Jesus and anything. Um, but food is important. Martin Luther said that you can look at food in one of two ways. Either to enjoy or to earn. Either to enjoy as a gift from God or try to earn righteousness. And he said, depending on what view you have, one will lead you to heaven and one will lead you to hell. Eating's a part of life. God created us for food. He made us that way before the fall. And he means for us to enjoy it together. And that's why for us as a church, every one of our community groups every week eats a meal. And it's one of the things we require when we ask of every community. Because that's the way we, we express tangibly our, our love and our union, our acceptance of one another through Jesus. Even every one of our worship services, just in a few minutes, we're going to eat and drink together in a special way. Eating is important. And we're always meant to, on top of that, be reaching out and trying to bring more people to the table for them to enjoy the goodness of God to us. You see, you can come here on a Sunday and you can, you can sit there in a chair and you can never really get to know anyone. I, I mean, you can be polite, sit next to people in church, sing songs next to one another and never become friends, never have them over to your home and never eat with them. And if we do that and we're just kind of keeping things official, then we're just playing church. We're not really loving and accepting one another. We're not getting into one another's lives and sharing life and food and drink. And that's not keeping in step with the gospel. It's not what, keeping in step with what Jesus calls us to. It's not keeping in step with what Jesus modeled for us. Live life with one another. So how are you guys doing on this stuff? You've been keeping in step with the gospel or you've been lagging behind or, or falling out of line, going astray? Have you been seeing Christianity as this thing that's just all about the right conduct instead of about the one who gave himself up on a cross for your failed conduct? Have you been letting food get the best of you? Thinking that if you just eat the right things or eat the right amount of things that you'll be happier as a person with your self-image and God will be happier too and other people will like you more? been letting something sneak in and 
and divide you in relationship with another person that shouldn't? Or you've been not really letting people in, not letting anyone really get to know you so you can experience God's love through that relationship? Only the gospel can keep us in step, opening our eyes to see Jesus and enable us to keep following him. He's the one we need. Well, let's move on to our last point for this evening, beloved brothers. It's quite the story of what happened here and the story of Peter. The hardest thing uh, to me about the, our text and our passage for tonight is that it doesn't tell us what happened after this. And people have got all kinds of crazy ideas about that. But one of the things I think we have to remember is that this old letter, it was originally written to a particular group of people. Now, the things that are in it, it's in the Bible, and they uni- stand universal and true for all people and all time and all places. They, they are for us. But they're written to a particular people who, who would have certain background knowledge about what happened between Paul and Peter. I'm sure everybody heard about what happened and knew what happened after it. I mean, you've got, think about it, you've got two of the biggest most well-known apostles and preachers in the world, and they have this titan clash in front of everyone. I mean, you better believe it that everybody heard and knew what happened. And they knew how it ended. So Paul didn't really have to get into it. His whole purpose and goal in Galatians is the gospel, and this story just helped illustrate that for a minute. Now, we don't have all the details, but we do know the end of the story, how it ended, not from Galatians, but actually from Peter himself. Several years after this encounter, God moved upon Peter to write a couple of letters that ended up becoming Scripture, and they're in our Bibles as First and Second Peter. At the end of his second book, Peter has some very endearing words for Paul. Listen to what he writes here. They are Second Peter 3.15. Our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. <laughs> Those are precious words. That's what he says. He calls him his beloved brother. I mean, we've seen already in the book of Galatians, as we've been studying it so far this year as a church several times, how the relationship that God brings us into with one another through Jesus is this relationship of spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we are a church family. Um, and here he calls Paul his brother. And not just his brother, but his beloved brother. Paul's a brother he loves a lot. And not only that, but notice what else he says. He says, Paul wrote some things, and what he wrote was wisdom from God. By this time, uh, Peter, he surely had what Paul wrote in Galatians in his hand. I mean, he read, had seen this, he read this, what Paul wrote, he said, yep, that's wisdom. I'm so glad Paul got in my face that day. I needed that. I was being a bonehead. I'm so glad. And Peter, he, he continued to mature and grow as a servant of the Lord. It's in Rome years later, tradition says, and, and the king there with Agrippa, he, he had a bunch of wives and concubines, and four of them Peter led to Jesus, and they joined the church, and that upset the king, and so they arrested um, Peter and told him they were going to crucify him, and when it came time for Peter to be crucified, the story says that, that Peter said, oh, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as my Lord. Will you do me just one favor and, and crucify me upside down? And they did. Peter, his life as a man, changed by the gospel. Yeah, great insights, made mistakes, and God continued to have grace on him and change him. Earlier we talked about how, Paul, uh, how Peter had this fear of being criticized from the circumcision party. But here we see is how, how Peter moved past being a, a coward and, and got courageous. He got courage to receive correction from a loving brother, a fellow brother in Christ from Paul. So with that, I can't help but think and ask, how how well are you at receiving loving correction? I mean, Peter did here. He received it several times from Jesus, several times throughout his life. In fact, I think in in large part, what, what it really being a Christian is, is humbly admitting over and over again where we've blown it and where we need Jesus and we're open and willing to change and we receive correction from one another. I mean, has someone been trying to speak into your life, trying to give you some wisdom and you're just not listening? Be humble. Hear them out. You don't just want to reject it out of some 
foolish fear. We need other people. I mean, maybe there's somebody that, that God wants you to speak into their life. You see some things that are concerning about, and they're not living in line with the gospel. And you need to talk to them about that. We, we need one another to help us to see our blind spots and then to help see the goodness of Jesus toward us. May God help us to love one another in that way as beloved brothers and sisters in Jesus. Well, let's wrap up. I, I love the story of Peter. I, I love Peter because I feel like, man, if there's hope for Peter, man, there's hope for me. I, I really do personally identify with him more than anyone else in the Bible. He's a, a sinner who's ever learning to abandon his, his self-confidence and to look to Jesus and fully trust in him. I've read a number of books on, on Peter, but one of my favorites is this little book called The Cross and the Spirit, Peter and the Way of the Holy. And I thought I'd read this little section uh, for you that really uh, captures, uh, this puts this all in perspective of what we're talking about. His I can originates from confidence in one's own flesh and leads one to discouragement and failure. When we forget that no attempt in spiritual things can be made in our own strength, God humbles us with repeated disappointments until he has taught us better. As Peter himself put it years later, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The cross is the crucial factor in the making of the rock person. To face fully the reality of the cross brings us to the other end of ourselves. We do not want to give up on our own confidence before the demand of the cross. The cross reveals the weakness of the flesh, puts to death inordinate claims, and points the way to a new basis for life in Jesus. So we prepare, prepare to respond to God's word this evening by coming to the table where we meet with Jesus who died on the cross. Jesus' body is the bread and his blood is the wine. What is what's God's spirit doing in you? What might he be opening your eyes to see? What blind spots is he pointing out? We talked about rock reputations. The truth is, man, if we could stand up here and tell the story and the episodes of each one of our lives and all the things that we've been through, there'd be a lot of ugly details. We see our lives as attempts to build them on sand. The only way we can ever become rocks is by building our lives on the true rock, the rock of Jesus. We talked about foolish fears. So easy to fear what other people say and think than fear God. The wonderful thing about Jesus is that he stood before those that criticized and condemned him and he was without fear. He boldly and courageously went to the cross to die for all of us cowards so that we might find courage in him. We talked about slipping soldiers. The truth is we're terrible soldiers in God's army. Every one of us has lost our footing. We've fallen behind. We've been led astray. But Jesus never did. He constantly kept in step with the Father, doing His will all the way to the end. And because He did that for us, Jesus will never leave any of His soldiers behind, no matter how far back we fall or how far astray we fall out of line. He'll come get us every time, just like He did for Peter. Lastly, we talked about beloved brothers. The truth is, we don't love each other as brothers and sisters as we should all the time, if at all. But Jesus is the best brother of all because he took all the fault and the blame on himself for us so that we could be right with God our Father and then that just births love in us for God and for each other. You see, the story of Peter is about Jesus. Jesus working in him to make him a rock, casting out his fears, enabling his feet to follow him and giving him a loving brother like Paul, to help him on his way. We all have blind spots. Times where we fall, Jesus picks us up once again, sets our eyes on him. No matter who we are, what's going on in our lives, Jesus is who and what we need. Jesus is who we need. Let's go to him in prayer.